curiosity, like creativity in that when it is stressful, curiosity is stifled, right? We don't have time to ask questions about things. We don't have time to wonder. We're just trying to keep everything stable and trying to manage everything that's happening. I mean, it's an exercise for us knowing we're alive and this is a part of how we've become who we are. And we need, we need to reinvest in our curiosity. Hello, everybody. You have joined us for another episode of Cap and Gown. Um, this is season four, episode 10. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources, joined today by Matt Boisvert. Hey, Matt. Hi, Rachel. This is a super weird day because it's foggy and rainy and gray. cold and gray. We couldn't even see like across the street this morning from our building. We're on the seventh floor. Are we on the seventh floor? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I got a brain glitch. We're on the seventh floor and we couldn't even see across the street. So it's a little bit strange. Um, but I'm happy to be able to spend this time with you and with our listeners. I know some of you have joined us live on LinkedIn. Hi. Always good to see you all. I know some of you are watching us through YouTube. Some of you listen to us as a podcast, wherever you get your podcast. We'd love for you to follow or like or do whatever you're supposed to do so that you get notified when we have our new episodes put up. And also to give us a rating if you find this to be helpful to you. Um, we'd love to hear about it. Matt, I have a surprise for you. Okay. Okay. It's not that big. You have a little bit of time to prepare for it. But, you know, next week, um, I don't think we have capping down because I think we're traveling. Is that right? No, we're, we're here next week. We're here next week. Okay. Well, one of the next two weeks, either next week or the week after, I'm not exactly sure. Do you know who my mm -hmm. guest is? Uh, no. Who? It's you. <laughs> well, that's a surprise. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be happy that I gave you a little bit of a heads up. What does that mean, Rachel? Well, I was talking to Brayden, you know, who's our director of operations, and she's super helpful in getting our guests set up for cap and gown. And I sent her kind of preliminary questions of here are things that I want to know about any guests that we have on. And she's like, I think that listeners would like to have you and Matt both answer these questions. So I'm scheduling you guys as guests. So she'll send you the questions and then I'm going to interview you. That'd be fun. Okay. All, All right. right. Yeah. Good to know. Aren't you glad I gave you a heads up? Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> You're very welcome. Prepare. Yeah, that's right. Um, all right. I have been looking forward to today because we are unveiling our 2024 theme. It, we're still in January, so I think we're doing a great job. It's not like, you know, we're halfway through and I couldn't make up my mind. So that is the content um, for today. We're going to talk a lot about why we chose the word that we chose and dig into it a little bit. And I personally am super excited about the theme. I, I'm glad we didn't unveil it last week because I changed my mind. And this theme makes me much happier than the other one I was considering. Before, <laughs> but before we switch themes, I just want to harken back to last year's theme. And really, I'm going to miss happiness found in translation mm -hmm. because I learned a lot of words, you know? And that's so maybe, boy, that's, boy, it was a good one. Yeah, that's maybe the best dollar twenty-five I ever spent. I found that book at the Dollar General. Wow. Yeah, I know it was okay. great. Right. So I'll yeah. I'll find you another book so that you can keep working on your phonics for this new theme. Okay? <laughs> uh, that was a great book, and it was a great theme. And so it's kind of to see that one go. Hopefully, we'll hold on to the joy, and and now we have a new theme. Yeah, for sure. But first, we need to examine the State of the Union. All right, the first two articles I'm going to pop up for you, um, they're Wall Street Journal articles. I'm not going to review them because they are so... Um, I think you just have to read them. So the first one is called Why Americans Have Lost Faith in the Value of College. Three generations of college for all in the U.S. Have, has left most families looking for alternatives. Um, that's it's not a long read. It's maybe four or five pages. What I like about it, although 
you know, it goes against my seven nature, which is I want for us only to talk about bright and happy things. But what I like about it is it lays out basically from the GI Bill to now um, a series of decisions that we've made in higher education that has made it more difficult for us to be successful in that industry. So I would just say everyone should read it to kind of unpack what's going on right now in higher education. I don't think it's, you know, it's not all a depressing picture. And I think there's a lot of really good things about it, but it would just be a super helpful article for anyone who wants to know really not just about the state of the union today, but kind of how we've gotten here. I think it's really powerful. And the other one that was on that slide is called why paying for college in the U S is so complicated. Sorry, I said that wrong. It's not why it is. It's why is it so complicated? And so that article just goes through all of the acronyms with paying for college, the FAFSA and the EFC and the CIC and the, all of the, the different acronyms and talks about sort of a new model, thinking through how we could work together with government and within our institutions to, to rethink the way that we're funding um, college. So I really encourage you to read those. And also, if you don't have, I, I think most of you through your schools can probably get Wall Street Journal, but we have that in PDF. So if you want it, you could probably just email me, Rachel at Ferris Resources, and I'll send it to you um, because I think it's a really, really helpful article. Anything you want to add about that? No, I just think it's really interesting how uh, just lately how these articles are really springing up. And, yeah. and of course, this is a much more in-depth uh, read than than a lot of things you'll find on like Inside Higher Ed or the Chronicle. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. <laughs> I don't have an article for you about this because I'm just going to tell you that the final Title IX regulations, we're not getting those until June, please. June. <laughs> so <clears throat> the reason they're estimating that is because they still, let's see, the education department still hasn't transmitted them to the Office of Management and Budget for Evaluation. That office gets 120 days to review the regulations. So if they don't have it yet, then when they get it, they'll have 120 days. So it's not going to be here for a while. Sorry, guys. That's all I have to tell you about that. Okay. The next um, article that I have for you is a continuing a continuation of our NIL saga. This one, though, is really interesting. This article talks about like it's not just chit chatting anymore about the NIL. This is actually there's a couple of bills in front of the House subcommittee around how we're going to regulate the NIL. This article refers to it as the Wild West of college sports right now, which I was thinking, you know, there's going to be a subgroup of college students who played sports between 19 or 19, 2021 and 2024, when the bill for or this idea of NIL first got passed, and now they've started to regulate regulate it, who really are living in the wild west of NIL, right? Like there's not a lot of rules. There's a lot of money getting thrown around. There's not regulations. That will be really interesting to hear um, those athletes come out about their experience there. This is the 11th hearing in front of Congress around the NIL. This is actually, though, a bill that they think is going to get passed. It has bipartisan support. It's kind of a common sense rules of the road, which includes things like codifying students' NIL rights, banning boosters and other third parties from offering inducements to students to play for a particular university, um, adding disclosure requirements for NIL details. Some people who oppose the bill really want for students to be counted as employees, Almost everybody thinks that's a terrible idea, especially for our smaller schools, because then all of a sudden you have like the, they just will go bankrupt. There's not enough money for them to be able to treat athletes uh, as employees. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to put it, uh, tell you about. 90% of NIL spending comes, uh, goes to males. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and... The NCAA, okay, two more things I want to tell you. The first is they want to create a new um, independent non-governmental organization led by 21 congressional appointees to oversee the NIL uh, process. So that's interesting. We need to have more oversight. Also, the NCAA is pretty mad about it because they're like, wait, we're in charge of all of this. What are you doing? Um, and 
the NCA or NCAA is getting most of what they've asked for, except that they are not going to have an antitrust exemption, which they really wanted so that they couldn't get in legal trouble. I bet. Anyway, pretty interesting. I think it's, yeah, and, and this makes sense. You have three years of kind of watching all the different ways that different universities and states have handled this. And so from a national level, I think it's it's always, you know, when is it when does it go from something that the NCAA kind of self-regulates, that NCAA schools self-regulate versus this needs to actually go to a national congressional level? Yeah, because now remember, a really big issue of this was that states were doing this differently. So this federal legislation is going to preempt whatever your state rules around this are and say, like, no, we have to level the playing field for everybody, which especially when you talk about big football schools, like where the big money is, yeah, that's yeah. going to be super important that everyone's playing by the same rules. Right. In this article, Rachel, do they calculate how many hours a football player would become like like how many hours a week a football player works? Well, they did have, let me see if I can find it. They did have a football player who actually testified and said he really wanted to be considered um, an employee. Let's see. Sorry. I'm yeah, don't ask me. Don't. No, no, no. It. This is what it says. It didn't calculate. This is what it says. Chase Griffin, a senior quarterback at the University of California, Los Angeles, disagreed on the question of whether student athletes should be considered employees. Quote, based on the number of time, effort, and hours we operate as employees currently. So some quantitative uh, statistics there would have been helpful, but they work hard and a lot. A lot. What they said. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, in that context, if you think about every football player at a small school being counted as an employee, that could be very expensive. Yeah. And maybe change some recruiting strategies well and not just that but if they are counted as employees they can go on strike which the ncaa really doesn't want so okay that's a that's another thing to think about all right yeah. in continued ai consideration i'm pretty happy about this because university librarians are the ones who are like hey campus we've got to figure out what we're going to do about ai and i trust them you know what i mean they're not like I love oh, librarians i I know. Yeah. I want them to be in charge of actually a lot of things. Um, there was just a survey that came out of the Association of College and Research Libraries, 605 respondents, who said, we have to help our faculty figure out what to do about the, this AI intelligence piece, specifically around the ethics and the privacy concerns. Um, only 3% of them said they had a very high understanding of AI tools, which is really interesting, right? We talked about this last week where it's like we're in that place where nobody really knows a lot about what's going on. They said they're fielding questions from faculty and they need training about things like ethics, um, how to troubleshoot what's going on with them. Those findings were like, here's seven things that you need to focus on of three of which identifying and evaluating AI use cases, critically assessing AI quality, biases, and ethics, and recognizing data privacy and security issues, which I love. I just read a whole paper on librarians and their security and data, like data privacy issues, because you can imagine, like, if you know what people are checking out, you know a lot about them. And so there's like this whole tenant of being a librarian, which is like, we keep your information very secure and we don't use it for anything other than to keep track of the book that you have and the book that you've brought back right like no data mining for librarians isn't that interesting yeah They're well just it's an interesting i mean so who's going to get them caught up on all the things they need to know about ai because my guess is that those who are putting out powerful ai don't want the librarians to be. Yeah, but Matt, that. this is what's so good about librarians. They know how to do research. Like they're learners. They're like, we're going to figure this stuff out. So I think it's, I'm thrilled. I think it's going to be great. We need to find a librarian and get them on to help us make sense of all this. Okay. Um, another article about entrepreneurs facing setbacks in college 
it's, I think, worth a whole read, but it talks about these critical incidents, which I think we're going to have to do a whole, whole show on critical incidents because all of a sudden I have heard that in four different places, which makes me think either where have I been or it's like everywhere all of a sudden. Right. Um, these are events that challenge one's mindset or worldview. So you can deploy it in a lot of different ways. I was just reading today about in classrooms, critical incidents, right? Where we have a conversation about something that you're like, wait, I've never thought about that before and how that can be really like when you're off balance, it can really change your brain. Um, but this article is about how so much of being an entrepreneur is absorbing critical incidents and not losing your mind about them. And so this study follows some undergraduates who were in a year long class where they had to come up with ideas. They had to raise capital from venture capitalists and then they had to execute their plan. And not everybody in that class was successful. So sometimes nobody raised money. And they're talking about how having faculty mentors to walk along students in those critical times to scaffold them and say, it's OK, how can you overcome this? What are you going to do? then creates grit and resilience in them so that when they go on to be real entrepreneurs and they're hit with those things, it's not like, I've always been successful. What am I going to do? It's like, oh, I have the tools to be able to respond to that. Interesting, right? Yeah, I like it a lot. I think it's an, an interesting process. And on the mentoring side, I'd be curious about faculty talking about their critical incidents. And, yeah. and really, I'm, I'm curious how many, I don't know, when I think about the professors that I had, whether at undergrad or, or graduate school, never really thought about them having cri critical incidents. Yeah. You know what I mean? For sure. So, One of the things they recommend is that have that you have actually uh, entrepreneurs come and talk about their failures, <laughs> which I was like, that would be a really tough class to have to come and talk about because the thing is, Matt, so when I interview you, we will talk about some entrepreneurial challenges that you have faced. But the nice thing about so many of those is that you have come out successful. It would be way harder to talk about the ones where you're like, and then my company shut down and I lost a million dollars. You know what I mean? That would be, that'd be a hard one if yeah. that had ever happened to, to have to talk about that. But I will say, you know, I did have a great mentor. We can talk about this more whenever, whatever day that is. But I did have a great mentor who I was facing a, a big challenge. And he's like, you're going to figure it out. I've, I've faced that before. And then I figured it, I figured it out. And a few years later, I had to overcome it again. So you're going to learn how to overcome it. So it's, yeah. that's a good process. You know, springboard is something that I'm really pretty uh, passion about that we started at, at my university, my alma mater. Yeah. And it's a neat process. So I, I love that. Where, where is this, um, taking place? This, uh, it's at Babson college. Okay. Babson college. Okay. Um, I, I have two more for you just really quick hits. Um, I, this next one that I want to do is about study abroad how schools are addressing study abroad for students who maybe don't know very much about it or have barriers to that. So three different ideas about it. The first one is Georgia State University does a free passport program where you can apply. You have to, there's rules, like you have to be a citizen, obviously, you have to be applying for the first time, you have to complete an online application, but then they give you the $130 passport fee for you to get your passport, which I love because I know it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but to some people, it is a lot of money. Also, it's a barrier. And so why wouldn't you in college just get your passport, make sure people have their passport. So when some amazing opportunity comes along, they have it, right? And they don't have to yeah. scramble for that. So I really love that idea. Arizona State is giving a $4,000 scholarship to apply to study abroad. So you can use that flexibly anytime after the spring semester of your sophomore year, and you can use it to pay for whatever you want. So again, there are some rules about that, like you have to apply for it, but $4,000 to go study abroad. And then one more, University of Memphis has a um, initiative through TRIO or Hooks Institute of African American Male Initiative, where they get $2,000 scholarship that they can apply to their passport and to airfare. Um, so TRIO, remember, is national. So they're like, we don't care what study abroad you go to, but it has to be in Memphis because that's where this uh, initiative is coming out of. And we'll give you $2,000 towards that. So I love it. It's not a lot of money. 
Delta actually, I think at Arizona State is the one that's funding that, giving scholarships for that. Um, and it's just a really quick hit, remove a barrier for some, from somebody having a great experience, which your son has just come back from a different person, right? Now, so two things that I just want to comment on. One, one for $140 or whatever it is to get your passport. What a gift. Yeah. And it, and it actually changes your mentality. Yes. It, it can change a student's mindset to have this now ability to go anywhere around almost anywhere around the world with this uh, passport, that's really powerful. And it's so low cost to, to encourage your students. Don't you and think then, alumni would, would do that? If you said alumni, like, hey, do you want to give to our scholarship fund for students to get their passport? Do you think alumni would love that? Yeah, it I is would. so, it's so low cost. Yeah. So, and, and I think as far as like uh, goodwill for a student to feel have positive um, feelings toward their their institution. That's a great one. Yeah. Now, study abroad is a huge experience, and everyone that I've talked to, um, whose kids went to ACU or or did a study abroad program, like my son, and and they're like, "Why didn't I do that? It was such a a transforming experience for them." Study abroad just is. There's so many things that that you can learn from that, and so yeah, my son coming back after a semester doing study abroad, he's a different person. Um, gotcha. Super motivated. Skills, right, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Super so. exciting. All right, last one, George Mason University has um, a program called Mason Chooses Kindness. This is where they just are intentional about modeling and showing kindness to each other, which I love. This is like, this is like a tenant of my parenting. Like, be kind, be kind to people, right? You have no idea what's happening with them. Be kind. So they actually picked this as a theme for 2021. And then the um, pandemic hit and they were like, oh my gosh, this is like how we want to live. We don't just want it to be a one-time thing. We want it to be all the time. So they have three basic things that they do. They have like a toolkit where they teach people about kindness. They have a... Um, Pats for Pats for Patriots, which I don't love the name, but Matt, listen, this is like what we do in Ferris 360, where they have anybody on campus can create recognition for somebody else with words of affirmation. They send that to the person with some tchotchke that's like, hey, you've been recognized through this thing. I love that. I think we should talk to schools about not just filling out outstanding student or something like that. But when you see those come through, this I think is a place where your little acorn idea, right, would come in handy. Like you have been recognized as a great part of our community and here's something really tangible for you to hold on to and, and remember. So I love that. I, I love acknowledging um, people who are making a difference. And then they also have kindness ambassador roles, which are people who are just have applied and have been trained and they're not looking at huge things, right? Like they're talking about writing notes to other people on campus or holding the door open or like just little ways to be kind to other people and generous to them and talk about changing a community and culture. If that's what you're focusing on, I mean, I want to go to that campus, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're starting to see the effects of, um, as you said, I, I think post pandemic, a lot of cocooning and a lot of people really not spending time thinking outwardly. Yeah. Um, and so being, being able to encourage that. And I, I would just love to hear the impact that that's having on their campus community. And then what that then does to the surrounding neighborhoods. Yeah, right? for sure. Yep. All right. That is the state of the union, at least as I've told it. Um, so let's dive into our theme for 2024. Um, I wish I had, I should have thought of like, I want a trumpet, like, bah, 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 you know, before we announce it, but I guess I'm just going to have to announce it without any fanfare. Hey, I, don't, I just don't, I just don't have that. Queued I, up I think in the budget for cap and gown, I would really like to have a noisemaker. I would like to just have a little noisemaker where I could push the buttons on it, you know, and we could have, it's fine. Yeah, okay. It's fine. We're just gonna we're just gonna move forward. But did you hear what I say? I need an That's terrible. That was terrible. That depressed me. Okay. Okay. All right. 
All right, drum roll, please. So our theme for 2024 is the word curiosity. I want to explain to you why we have picked this word. And also I want to dive into it a little bit. And I'm just going to warn you that for our listeners today, the word curiosity is one of my favorite words. It's one of Matt's favorite words for almost everyone. I can't think of somebody who doesn't fall into this category, but maybe there is almost everybody on our team. Curiosity is one of our favorite things to do together. We love to wonder and ask questions. Um, and so today you are going to get a little window into my brain in terms of curiosity. Don't be alarmed. Okay. <laughs> Don't be concerned about what I'm going to disclose to you about things that I get curious about. But um, when we think about curiosity, we think of like shallow curiosity, which is kind of a fun kind of curiosity where you're asking sh kind of shallow questions, which we're going to talk a little bit about, but then also a deep curiosity where you're really wondering about important subjects. And I think about curiosity like creativity in that when it is stressful, curiosity is stifled, right? We don't have time to ask questions about things. We don't have time to wonder. We're just trying to keep everything stable and trying to manage everything that's happening. And so coming out of an experience where we've had a lot of stress and we're wearing a lot of hats and everything is changing and we've endured and we've had, you know, frustration, I think the window is opening up for us, us to really um, craft and cultivate and nurture a sense of being curious about different things. And Matt, not only do I think that it increases our joy in life and our enjoyment of life, but also if you think about how many times we're talking to schools about how they're coming back into a different environment. We have different students. We have, we've lost our traditions. We don't have the same rhythm of the academic year. We now are doing hybrid things. We're doing Zoom things. Like it's a different experience. And part of what I think can happen if you don't have curiosity is you can keep doing the things that you've always done because that's the way that you've done it, which we know is a terrible idea. Right. Um, but also, you if you aren't asking good questions and wondering about, is there a better way for us to do this or how could we do this differently, you miss amazing opportunities. And so much of what we talk about, um, especially on the State of the Union, comes from somebody being curious about why do our first generation students not do study abroad, digging into that and then saying, oh, my gosh, they don't have passports. OK, that's a problem that we can solve really, really, right. Easily, right. So helping you adapt to this changing, changing piece in a smart way, I think, is one of the joys of curiosity. Anything you want to add to that? Well, I was just thinking back to um, I don't know, from the time I was a little kid and my mom would read Curious George books to me. I think she thought I was like Curious George. Where <laughs> I, you know, I'd see the the rain uh, collect and roll through down to the gutters and want to chase it down. There's, I just remember, I think we read every Curious George book. The yeah. idea of being curious was certainly something that, that was encouraged to me. Like, don't stop asking questions yeah. about things. And I think we can apply it to our work in terms of higher education by by asking questions about why we do what we do and why do you do what you do? And that's a part that we'll talk about, right? That there's an internal piece to that, but there's also an external piece to that and trying to understand other people and why they're making the decisions that they're making and why they're running their lives the way that they're running them. Um, you know, we talked years ago about KIPP schools, which is a K through 12 school that's really remarkable they have seven characteristics of successful students. Um, in case you're curious, they are optimistic, um, curious, they're full of zest, they have grit, they have self-control, they have social intelligence, and they have gratitude. Um, so this piece of curiosity, Matt, for you and me, like years ago when we were talking about what kind of a company do we want to have, curiosity came out as we just want to be wondering and asking questions all the time. And like I said, I think it is a state of mind that you can nurture. So some people are naturally like that and some people have to learn how to be like that. And we have a year to do it. So I think it's going to be fun to kind of guide yeah, through um, that piece. 
Okay, so let's start with my favorite, which is shallow curiosity. Shallow curiosity is where you just ask questions about things that occur to you. So I wonder why this or what's happening there or what's going, right? Just, it's not like a deep dive, although sometimes it turns into that. But these are the questions that you Google because you just want to know. I was riding in the car with somebody the other day and they said, well, I wonder what, I don't even remember what it was. Like, I wonder how many Cokes they sell in the United States in a year. And I was driving and the person said that and then didn't Google it. And I was like, wait, we could know that, <laughs> which, you know, I say all the time, wait, that's something that we could know. Google, could you Google that please? Because now I'm just going to wonder about it instead <laughs> of actually having an answer to it. So, okay. So I would like to let you into my brain, although you, you are in on some of these Google searches. Okay. So I just looked over the past year, what past, like past year, 2024, what are some things that I have Googled? Okay. Uh, Sishu, the word Sishu in Finnish, what does it mean? Which is your fault because you came fault. in. Yeah. And said, I don't know how you heard that word. Was it a movie that you watched? Is that what you said? Or you just heard it somewhere? There's a movie by that title on it's Amazon. S-I-S-U. What does it mean in Finnish? In case you're curious, it means determination in like the most extreme fundamental way. So the, this uh, article that we read was like, it is, it is core to Finnish cultural identity, right? So you guys can Google it. There's a lot to say about it. We don't have time, but like SU, and the, yeah, they would just say like, it's hard to translate how, what exactly this means, but it is like in the face of adversity, like determination beyond any fear. Yeah. Okay. The next thing that I Googled was who was the tallest man? How tall was he? I forget his name. Wood Woodra or something Woodra, I think, but he was 8'11". So there you go. Um, <laughs> next, I Googled, what is the best frozen dinner? <laughs> What'd you because discover? Amy's green enchiladas is the okay. best, is the most award-winning frozen dinner. So there you go. Oh, Rachel Elam's with us and she just chatted true. So it must be true. <laughs> now, you know. Okay. I also Googled the movie Whale Rider, which have you seen that movie? I have not. Okay. I Googled it because I was reading an article that said Moana was loosely based on Whale Rider. And so I was wondering like what it was about and, and now I have to watch it. It looks amazing. Okay, sorry, just a couple more. I'm just giving you examples of shallow curiosity, okay? All the different places your brain might take you. Yes, exactly. All right, I Googled any <laughs> Enneagram types as animals. What's your animal? My Enneagram type is seven. My animal is butterfly. Three is a chameleon. One is a bee. Um, let's see if I remember any other ones. Six is a deer. I don't remember the other ones because I don't have people super close. Oh, Z. Z is a two and she's an elephant. Rebecca is a two. So anyway, okay. It's interesting. Um, two more for you. What is a rhizome? Because I was looking at a company that's name was rhizome and I was like, I think that's a part of a root. It is. What is the difference between pasteurized and ultra, ultra pasteurized milk? Because I was reading an article about well, how I mean, yeah, this was ultra pasteurized good. milk does not taste as good as pasteurized milk. So the big difference is how long and how hot they heat something, in case you're curious about it. Um, okay, and then I have two more for you. I'm gonna show you a picture that that appeared in my Instagram feed. And I was like, I have to figure out what the heck this is about. So this picture is of the Hidden Valley Ranch Burt's Bees special limited edition chapstick, which comes in fresh carrot Hidden Valley Ranch flavors. I don't know if it tastes like this or smells like that. I didn't get that answer. Buffalo sauce and crunchy, crunch, crunchy celery. These came out as a April Fool's joke 
like a year ago and everyone was like, I'd buy that. And so they released it before, like kind of in honor of the Super Bowl because it's the most wing eating day in America. Actually, I do know they taste that way because all of these people are like, you have to layer it to get the full effect. You need to put on celery first and you need to put on ranch. Oh no. I'm just saying if you saw that, you would have to be curious about it, right? Like I can't just be like, that's weird. I have to be like, wait, what? Why does this thing exist? Okay, and one more for you. I saw this chart the other day, which is what is the most common kind of hot sauce by every state? In Texas, it's Louisiana hot sauce. In Louisiana, it's Tabasco sauce. Well, yeah. Um, and then you can see Chula in some of our northern states. Some of these I don't even recognize, but Frank's Red Hot, like in the northeast, that's the real deal. That's what you make buffalo chicken wings out of. So I don't know. I don't know why I wonder about these things. But when I see those things, it satisfies my, satisfies my shallow curiosity. And I think it's a great way to bring joy. And to talk to other people about, here's the thing I learned that I think is super interesting. You know, another thing that you have... I think it's shallow curiosity. I think it fits the definition of shallow curiosity, but words like the yeah. way that you like to pick up words and like, I, I want to know that word. I'm curious about when the right time is to use that. And then mm -hmm. you drop it and you're like, boom, yes, see that? did it right. Now I was thinking about shallow curio curiosity the other day when you were telling me the story about tumbleweeds, which we do not have time for you to tell the story. of tumbleweeds. <laughs> Okay. But if our listeners would like to practice curiosity go look up tumbleweeds because matt wove a whole story about tumbleweeds that i was sure he was lying about because it involves russia <laughs> and sabotage lo and behold the history of tumbleweeds okay so that's some homework for you guys if you're like what in the world that's our teaser for you to practice a little bit of shallow curiosity um it's a great story so yeah okay anything you want to add about shallow curiosity no, I think that's really helpful. I mean, hopefully, I, I think people who listen to, to you do cap and gown. There's there's definitely some curiosity in that whole, I mean, just, just like what we covered last week, right? So yeah. there's some shallow curiosity in that. But then the transition to deep curiosity, right, would be like, hey, that's that's a thing that I want to actually spend more time, go deeper on this, this issue an issue facing higher ed or our students, culture and generational issues. Yeah. Um, so that, that, I mean, shallow curiosity is, is rewarding. On right. Its own. And I, yes. And I think it's super important to say we want both of them, right? There is something playful and fun and joyful about being able to chase down and learn new things. And then there's this other like really needy thing that we can do trying to understand others. So let me talk about this deep kind of curiosity. First of all, <clears throat> if you don't know, curiosity is a tool that has kept us alive. This, <clears throat> this is how you sort of explore new lands and meet new people and figure out what foods you can eat. And it is a way for us to be successful in the world, to be curious about things. If you're an entrepreneur, you have your curious about ideas and has ever anyone ever done that before so curiosity is really really important to the human condition and actually when you are curious about something it creates dopamine so it is a pleasure drug when you're wondering about a thing your brain kind of lights up with some excitement and some enjoyment about the novelty of the thing that you're wondering about also curiosity is not taught babies are born curious in fact I was reading the other day that um, in a lot of schools, and I think it's in, maybe it is in Norway, they have signs that say children are scientists because they are so curious about everything because they're trying to learn the way the world works. And there's some sadness that as we get older, we just kind of are like, I'm not going to wonder anymore. I have, I'm too busy. I have things to do. But it is something that, that children are born with. They will stare at a, an unfamiliar scene longer than something they've seen before because it sparks that curiosity. It makes them feel good to wonder about things. So it's interesting that it's not a taught thing, although it can be a nurtured thing, right? You can practice that uh, in your life. <clears throat> I mean, the just being around little kids and the what's that, what's that, what's that, why, 
right? Yes. I mean, but the the endless what's that is yeah. When you see a little kid like Aiden, my my oldest, he was super curious, and today I can still see that yeah. that light of. Fortunately, he still has that desire to learn and and just he's curious about a lot of things. But from a young age, just watching him be curious about how a doorknob worked. Yeah. How did this and and back and forth and he'd study it. It's a pretty neat thing. And like you said, I mean, it's an exercise for us knowing we're alive and this is a part of how we've become who we are. And we need we need to reinvest in our curiosity. Right. For sure. Yeah, it is, it is meaning making, right? It is the quest to understand why and how and who, and to not just sort of blindly walk through your day because you're overwhelmed and stressed and you're like, I don't care about any of it. Like, I'm just trying to get the groceries and fix dinner, you know? So I love that idea of cultivating curiosity. So the book that we're going to talk about, at least for this semester, I don't know if it's going to take us the whole year and I've got a bookshelf full of books about curiosity that we can talk about, but the book we're going to talk about today is called, or this semester is called Seek, How Curiosity Can Transform Your Life and Change the World. Um, And so Scott talks in this book about deep curiosity. And there are three sort of applications or maybe channels of deep curiosity that I want to unpack for you. Um, The first one is an inward deep curiosity. So this is where, like in a very basic level, we're like, am I hungry? Am I tired? Do I, how do I want to spend my time? Right. But there's also these things about like, who am I and how am I gifted and what makes me come alive and how do, um, I want to be in the world. And how am I in the world? How do I make sense of my preferences and how I treat people and what I do and those sorts of things? It is an inward spotlight to understand who you are. And this sometimes is a a curiosity that is deprioritized for adults. I feel like (laughs) this may be, I don't mean this to sound snarky, but I feel like college students are super great at inward deep curiosity, right? They really are trying to understand in their student development side, like, who am I and how do I, maybe that's just psychology majors. <laughs> maybe when I was in college, I was just surrounded by psychology majors and that's all we did. Just wonder about why am I the way that I am, right? Um, but then sometimes you get to a place in your adulthood where you're like, yeah, I got it. Like, yeah, I know, I understand who I am. And it's always really exciting I'm thinking about Matt a couple of years ago, first of all, when we found Enneagram, but second of all, a couple of years ago when you were like, what do you think about your eight wing? And I was like, I have an eight wing. This is something I've never considered before. Let me go do all of this research. That is a revelation to me. It's going to change the way that I think about myself and the way that I am in a room and like all of that kind of stuff. As an adult, it's such a delight when you discover something new about yourself, but you can only do that when you focus on who am I and how have I changed and how am I growing, right? And a lot of times we're like, oh yeah, I know who I am. I'm, I'm kind of done with that piece. Yeah. I think the the deep part of that, so not who I am in a shallow sense, but, but really taking time to explore the why you are. Um, I mean, you know, just, just in the, in the past 45 days, done a lot of work on that. Like I've I've done a lot of inward understanding. I mean, I think coming out of uh, what we've, we've all talked about, you know, the, the lingering effects of COVID are kind of shocking, but, but to be at a place where you really start to get to um, what's happening and what are the, what's behind that? What are the motives to get out of that? Um, And and like, what are, what are the things that bring me, so going back to last year's theme, but what bring me joy? What are the things that bring me joy and how, how can I get back into those things? So, um, that inward peace, inward curiosity, I think brings, brings you back to life. Yeah, it for really, sure. really does. for sure. Um, so the next piece is outward curiosity. And this is when we wonder about other people. We think about our relationships, right? How I want to feel in a relationship. We think about the news. We think about just others, just applying that curiosity to community and to people. 
this is a huge thing in counseling, right? If you think about outward curiosity in counseling, it is what we are doing. We are not in counseling trying to solve problems. We're just wondering. We're wondering why you're making those decisions. We're wondering why you feel that way. We're wondering what's the next thing you're going to do. And we're wondering if you do this thing, what's going to happen next? And so for outward curiosity, um, you know, we talk about unconditional positive regard. It's showing up in a space with somebody and just creating room to say, help me understand. I assume you're doing that for a real reason that makes sense to you. Help me understand why you're doing those things, right? Um, and I think in that space, <clears throat> you and I have been talking a lot about the sort of attribution to the other instead of attribution to self. So if you are only curious inward, you become a narcissist, right? Because you're always only thinking about, well, I wonder why that made me feel that way. And I wonder why I got angry about that. And I wonder why blah, blah, blah. Instead of being like, hey, there's another person and they live in their space and they have a whole inner life too. And you can wonder about why they said that or why they did that without it being something that you have to take on and be like, I'm responsible for this thing. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I, I think right now is a pretty great time to have some outward curiosity, some deep outward curiosity. Um, I don't know. There's, there's, I think there's a lot of examples that have nothing to do with you, right? Yeah. So, I mean, you could really separate yourself and, and explore. And I think, so I'm, I'm looking at it from, um, as we've talked a lot about what's going on, kind of outward, thinking about universities, but then just here we are, uh, 2024, we have a new election cycle coming up and looking at some of the things that are happening um, in, in that. And there's a lot to be curious about in that as well. You know, like. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about in terms of, uh, so, so I took a whole trip there about kind of a leadership position and how so many times when you have outward curiosity, it solves the problem of I'm right and I'm trying to convince you you're wrong and I'm trying to tell you the way that it is. And instead be like, I don't know, maybe you have a different perspective that I would like to understand and actually would change the way that I feel about that thing, right? So it's, again, move your chair, why don't you? You don't know how to move your chair unless you're outwardly curious about why is that so important to you or why are you saying that or what what is the value? So we're not looking for a position. What is your position? We're looking for what do you value in that, right? What is important to you in that, which I think is really powerful. I, I love, so we we watch uh, the behavior panel a few, you know, occasionally. And one of the guys, Mark Bowden, he says one of one of his first things he does is he says, take your assumptions, all the things that you're assuming about this person or this case, take all of your assumptions and just put them over here on the shelf and then watch it cleanly. Watch it from, right. from a pers perspective that doesn't include you and all of your, what you've brought to the table, your assumptions on it. Then you have a, a clear, a clearer understanding of, of what's happening or ability to watch what's happening. Yeah. I think that's really powerful when we think about all of these things. For right? sure. The curiosity instead of the I know why. I already know why. So yeah. I'm just gonna go from that instead being like, help me understand why, right? Okay, so inward, outward. Uh let me say one more thing about outward. I think over this year it's gonna be really helpful as we are adjusting to kind of a new normal in higher education to have that attitude with our students, with our colleagues, with our bosses, to wonder about what's going on with them and for them and what they need and how we can show up for them. Uh, <clears throat> because that's how we can shape sort of a new way of being with each other. Um, in the year to come. Okay. The last piece of deep curiosity is called beyond. And beyond is if you're a person of faith, these are where you're asking questions about God and about, you know, the per your purpose and about what happens to you after you die. But really any sort of beyond curiosity is just bigger than you. So Matt, you know, I've been wrestling with <laughs> Joseph Campbell and his mono myth and like how myths across the globe try to explain our creation and all of that kind of stuff. And even if you're not a person of faith, that idea of how do humans wrestle with 
How did we get here? What am I supposed to do, right? What are my connections to community? That would be curiosity about the beyond. Um, and that beyond, what does it mean to be human? How do I show up? as a person in the world, you know, we, when I was doing career counseling, it was always, where do your gifts impact the world, right? How, how can you use those things to make the world better? And that's the kind of curiosity that we're thinking about with this beyond piece. What I, what I love about the beyond. So, you know, for me, I love exploring the future. Where does this go? And I also love looking at the past. So just like way like ancient past trying to understand that and then coming up through you know there's just so much to learn there but thinking about being curious about the future so when we look at and so when i'm listening to state of the union as you're breaking down all of these things it is uh where does this take us 10 years yeah. from now where where will we be with nil in 10 years yeah what what do we expect to happen with the influence of and changes of Title IX. What, where do things like study abroad? What's the role of study abroad in our institutions? Not not right now, but in the future. And I think beyond thinking, cu beyond curiosity, certainly is is thinking about um, some beyond for us right now. But beyond in the future, where will higher ed be? Where will the United States higher education system be? in 30 years. Yeah. That's a, that's a big one. And I want to understand that. I'm curious about that because then we can start doing what a lot of, what you always highlight, like Babson University is highlighting a thing. They're thinking, they're curious and they're thinking beyond and they're trying to make changes. Arizona State is doing a lot of that, right? Yeah. yeah. But that comes from this, this beyond curiosity. And I think, so when all three of those pieces intersect, when we look inward, when we look outward, when we look beyond, when we're curious about those things, that's where we have a really rich curiosity. So an example of that would be inward curiosity about how the way my parents parented me made me me, right? What are the things about me that I can point directly to the way Alan and Sharon raised me? And then outward, if I intersect that with, okay, well, what kind of a parent do I want to be? How do I want to treat my daughter? And then beyond thinking about what should parents do? How should parents act? What are truths about sort of an archetypal parent that we would say, these are the things a parent should provide, right? That's when you get that really rich understanding of those things as you as you're, have the intersection of the three. And Matt, we were talking about in higher education, this would be a really powerful exercise. Do you want to talk a little bit about kind of applying it in higher education? Well, I think so. If you just take exactly what you said and, and the first piece is like the how how did I do college? What was my college experience? What was important to me? What were the things that had the most impact on me? What what were the, the things that I didn't like or that didn't resonate with me when when I did college? And then thinking about, so for us, when we worked at a university, I definitely, I definitely taught this way. How do I want to deliver a college experience to my students? How do I want to teach them? What, what was the best practice for lear learning for me? Right. And then, so that's that outward, how do I deliver this? And then the beyond is, is I think exciting. Like what is college meant to be? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a huge question. What is the responsibility of college today? Yeah, Matt, because when you when you combine all of those things, then you can identify a roadmap, right? You can say, here's how I experienced college, but college students are different than me. So what is it that they need and who am I working with and what are we delivering? We have non-traditional students, right? We have students who are more interested in career. We have students who want experiential learning, right? What, what are all of those things? And what is college meant to be in a global way, not in a specific way? It's a career path. It's a way for you to have a network of people. It's a way for you to have student development, right? What are all of those things? And then is there a different way that we could put those things together 
that then gives us this path forward to say in 30 years, this is where we think we're going to end up in a strategic way, right? Yes. If you think about any of those individual things, you you don't have the path. If I think students need what I had, they're wrong, right? If I'm not thinking about what it's like to be an unsuccessful college student as I'm thinking about today's students, I've made a mistake because I'm missing out on something really important that I learned. And if we're not thinking about what is the role of college, then you just keep showing up to the same thing over and over and over again until it's defunct and no, it's not important anymore. So you really have to have that intersection of curiosity to have a rich and really robust understanding of the thing. Right. Okay. I want to break this down two other ways. I, I just okay. think this is important. So if you think about Ferris and what we deliver, I mean, one, one of the huge things is from you, an inward reflection of, I was an at-risk college student, right? That That is something that you have talked about and explored. There's some curiosity behind that. At the time, you didn't really fully understand it. Today, you have this very clear articulation of why you were an at-risk college student. Yes. But outwardly, how would an how would an at-risk college student want to be talked to, seen, engaged, right? So so that piece of this is my experience. I don't know all at-risk students, but outwardly I I know these are truths to that, right? And so then thinking about what what is it meant what is it meant to be to provide student success? and engaging those students like me. I think that's a great, that's a really powerful um, way of looking at it. The other one that I, I think about is like, I, you know me, I, I am wound tight on service uh, delivery, excellence in services, right? I've always been, I've always been, um, I wouldn't say I was curious about service excellence, it was just an expectation. But I wanted to understand service excellence. So the, inwardly, it's super important to me, but I want to understand how to deliver that. And then outwardly, man, that's what I want our company, our people to deliver to our um, clients and partners, right? Yeah. So sure. understanding all of that and, and how you apply that. And so for our listeners, I think that for you, there's some inner truths that you can then apply and think about and then think more broadly, like what what is the impact that we could have if we apply this thing that's really important to me to our students or to um the i don't know well overall, our our colleagues at our institution how can yeah, we make I, an impact i think it's really interesting also to to have it focused so we're talking about higher education but you can be really focused in what you're providing right that you can actually say in the career center, here was my experience of the career center. Here's what our students need now. What is the purpose of the career center at our university? Is it to just have 5,000 jobs listed that every student can go look through? Or are there other elements there that we need to think about? So I think that you can be as focused with your curiosity in the, the intersection of these three or as broad as, as you want to be. I wrote this down, Rachel, and I think this is really important. This may be just important to me, but as I'm reflecting on curiosity in these different things and, and thinking, again, going about, back to outward um, judgment, maybe you need to hear this. I'm not saying you do, but maybe <laughs> one of our listeners, maybe one of our listeners needs to hear this as well about inward judgment, making taking t all of those judgments. That's not curiosity. Right. A, a judgment is not curiosity. Again, what Mark Bowden's saying about put it on a shelf, all of your assumptions, all of your judgments, then you can be curious. Coming into a thing with judgment is not is not showing any curiosity. And I think that this is one of those things that's a real wrestle um, in our culture today is a, is a rush to judgment and not taking time to really be curious to understand these three pieces, inward, outward, and, and then the beyond. Yeah, you know, that is making me think about in counseling, we say, um, uh, when you say, I will never do this thing, you've cursed yourself. Because what you do when you say, I will never do this thing, is that then you have taken the breadth of response and behavior away. Now, now, no matter how you respond to a thing, you for sure can't do this thing. Because right. you judged it to be bad. And unfortunately, there are times where maybe that thing is the right Thing to do for this circumstance. And so it's interesting, the sort of locking down of your brain 
to be like, that's wrong. That's bad. I shouldn't. I won't. I don't like this about me. I don't like this about you. I don't like this about other people. <clears throat> then puts you in a position where you can't have this broader curiosity about what else could I do? Are there times where that's the right thing to do? Are there reasons why you are the way that you are, right? So I um, am, I'm actually super excited about the cultivation of curiosity over the next year. I would challenge our listeners. I think a couple of things that you can do just to kind of start is, first of all, think about the last time that you got curious about something. What was it? I, I have self-disclosed all of my crazy, <laughs> shallow curiosities, but also think about your deep curiosities and the things that you wonder about. Um, and recall that. And, and, you know, Matt, when we talk about career, we talk about flow. Like when you're wondering about things and you're working hard to understand and it's just out of your reach, there's something really, really rewarding about that. That's your dopamine going off when you're, when you're chasing, right. Um, something. Also, I would wonder about which of those three inward, outward, beyond comes most easily for you. So where is it easy for you to show up in curiosity? And then which one is a little bit more difficult for you where you're like, yeah, I don't know that I spend a lot of my curiosity in that time. And that will be a nice way for you to say this one is easy. And then this is one that maybe I need to work on a little bit. And then the last thing, which I really love is just pick three things to wonder about. They can be totally made up. I told you, I was like, if I were going to pick three things, what would I wonder about? I would wonder about the most common girl's name in 2012 when my daughter was born. I have it written down. I looked it up. It is uh, Sophia. Just wonder about a thing. It's a muscle that you can practice shallow wondering. And then also in your work with your colleagues, you can wonder about some really deep things. So those are ways for us to cultivate curiosity and wondering. Um, and we will do this book for the rest of the semester. We're going to talk about things like what gets in the way of curiosity. Um, we're going to talk about the dive model of curiosity, limits of curiosity, and why curiosity can make you courageous. So I'm super excited to cover all of those things. Do you have any last words you want to add before we're done? No, mm -hmm. I'm no. Okay. So I got the schedule straight okay. next week. I'm, I'm actually really excited. You're not on next week. Next week, Michael Burns from Mary Harden Baylor is going to be on. He is one of our great partners. He um, has done tons of work in student conduct. He's super smart about the epic journey. So I've presented with him before, um, but that is going to be a really great interview. I'm excited for everyone to meet him. And then you are the week after that. So the week after, which is the... Two weeks uh, later. 13th. February, yeah. sorry, February, th our next show, February 13th, you'll be on. So put it on your calendar. All right, guys, All right. Um, we're excited to spend time with you. We hope that you have a curious rest of your week and we look forward to seeing you again. Have a great day. Bye.